Okay, so now we're ready to find the overall heat transfer coefficient for the roof. This is going to be a long formula, so let's see if I can get it all on one line. It's going to be 1 over, we have the film coefficients, so 1 over 1 1.63 plus 1 over 4. And then the next one we had was the concrete, which is on a per inch basis, and it's 4 inches of concrete. So 0 0.11 units of resistance per inch times 4 inches. And then next we have this elastomer where they gave us the K value. So this is going to be an L over K situation. It's 2 inches. So 2 inches over 0.28 plus 0.33, which is our assumption for this asphalt paper. And then 0.63 for the plywood. And then 3.85 times 8.5 inches for the fiberglass insulation. 0.56 for the drywall and 1.19 for the acoustical ceiling tile. Now this whole thing turns out to be 1 over 43.88, but I think it's interesting that this term alone is 32.7. So roughly speaking, 3 quarters of the insulating properties of the roof are attributable to the fiberglass insulation, which is why it's not a huge deal if we were to take this 0.33 out. We'd still get very close to the right answer ultimately. Okay, so if we actually do that division, we get the overall heat transfer coefficient for the roof is 0 0.023 BTU per hour foot squared degree F. You really want this value to be as small as possible. You want as little heat transfer through the roof. The better insulated it is, the more energy efficient it will be. So with that, let's find the total heat transfer through the roof. Q dot roof is going to be UA delta T, where delta T is the cooling load temperature difference. So 0 0.023 BTU per hour foot squared degree F times the area of the roof, which is 6,000 square feet. And the CLTD that we assumed was 74 degrees Fahrenheit. And I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. That is a massive delta T. But it's July and it's 4 p.m. So there's an incredible amount of solar heat load on the roof of this building. So that gives us 10,212 BTU per hour. And that's in addition to what we already computed for the walls. So we've done the walls, we've done the roof, and now we're ready to look at the windows. And this is where it gets a little confusing. So when it comes to solar load through windows, the section I always flip to is 43.9, where they give us this equation for windows, it says Q equals UA CLTD. So that's sort of like a regular heat transfer equation, like a UA delta T. But then they tack on this additional term, which is the area times a shading coefficient times a solar load factor, which is an energy rate per unit area. Not per unit area and delta T, just per unit area. So it's basically saying you have a window, it has this area, the sun's hitting it, there's a certain amount of shading, there will be some solar load. And this is a number that you would look up. So just for clarity here, this is the solar load factor. And the reason I'm being so detailed here is I want to give you everything I know because there's some pieces of this that are not totally clear to me. So by saying what I am sure about, I'm hoping some folks can chime in and fill in some of the gaps for me and for everyone else that is using these videos. So in much the same manner as the roof and the walls, we have an overall heat transfer coefficient U that we'll need to find for the windows. Now it's a little interesting how the solution shows it. They show HI and HO and then a K value for the glass. And in much the same manner we did, they add up the resistances and calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the K value they used anywhere, but I was able to kind of sense check it with information I found online. So I'm going to do it both ways here, and you can either go with what the solution did or you can use other sources to try to make an estimation. So HI and HO are the same as what we used before. And then for the glass, they use this K value of 0.45, which has units of BTU inch over our foot squared degree F. And again, I can't find this in the MERM. But if you were to find that value or if you accept that 
as a given, then you can find u for the windows as being 1 over 1 over 1.63 plus 1 over 4 plus it's going to be L over K. But now what is the L? It's quarter inch glass. So 0.25 inches divided by 12 inches per foot. That gives you the thickness in feet over 0.45. Actually, that makes me think that this is even more wrong because either this should have been feet in order for feet to cancel or they shouldn't have divided by 12. So I now think that the solution is pretty suspect and I'm really just realizing that now as I go through this. But I'm gonna continue on because really this is to illustrate the process. There's nothing super critical about this particular problem. I'm doing this for our collective benefit of how you work through finding a heat transfer coefficient. So let's not get too hung up on it. We'll stay consistent with the solution. This works out to one over 0.91, which is 1.1 and it would have units of BTU per hour foot squared degree F. And then just as a sense check of all this, what I did as an alternate was just hopped on Wikipedia and looked up quarter inch single glazing and they give a U value that already incorporates some assumed film coefficients. So you don't have to do the individual resistances and add them up and run the formula. They're just giving you the overall number directly. And again, there's some level of accuracy there, but the value that came up as typical was 5.7, but it was in SI units. So it was Watts per meter squared degree Kelvin, which we can change. Let's do 3.412. BTU per watt, so that gets rid of watts, and then one meter squared is 3.281 feet squared, and then there are five Kelvin degrees for every nine Fahrenheit degrees, and if you multiply all that together, you get a number that's right around one per hour foot squared degree F, so that's within 10% of the 1.1 number they got, so I suspect this is either BTU foot that's probably what it is because the ultimate value that they get isn't unreasonable, but the units are clearly not working. So it's got to be the units they put on the K value going in. And that's just the beginning of the confusion. <laughs> now when we plug it into the formula, it gets even hairier. So now I'm going back up here and referring to this formula with the CLTD. And we're looking for a Q dot for the windows. So the first term is UA delta T. We have our one BTU hour foot squared degree F for our U value. And the area of the windows is 150 square feet. And the delta T, since these windows are on the east, I wanna use the CLTD as per the formula, so I'm putting in 20 degrees F. But what I thought was interesting about the solution is that they show the actual difference between the outside and inside design temperatures. They do T outside minus T inside. And I don't know why that is. Obviously it's not so different, it's 18 versus 20, but I would think that they would follow the formula. So that's one of my first questions here. And I'll, I'll note each of these down in turn. Now for the second part of the formula, it's area times shading coefficient times solar load factor. So the area is 150 feet squared. And then the shading coefficient that they use is 0.95. I believe you can look this up in one of the ASHRAE books. And then the solar load factor that they're using is 26 BTU per hour per foot squared. I'm not completely sure where that comes from. And then they tack on this extra correction here, this 0.56, which they explain as some separate adjustment above and beyond the shading coefficient. Now, intuitively, that makes sense because it seems like if you have shades with full coverage, that shouldn't only knock down the solar load by 5%. 45% sounds a lot more like it. So maybe these two taken together are, are working, but I just don't know how you go from intuitive assumptions to actual numbers. This is coming from a lookup table. And the value that comes out of all that is 5,075 BTU per hour. So it is a significant heat transfer through the windows. I just want to note down some of these questions in a different color. So that's which value should be plugged in here. Should it be the cooling load temperature difference or should it be the actual temperature difference? 
and then where do you look up the solar load factor and then what is this separate adjustment above and beyond the shading coefficient so those are some questions okay so let's now go for the total heat gain the total heat gain will be the sum of the walls roof and windows we're neglecting the floor and the values we found were 8107 BTUs per hour 10,212 and most recently for the windows 5075 which gives a total of 23,394 BTU per hour and that is the answer to part A and I really want to stress for this problem the accuracy here has got to be plus or minus 15 or 20 percent at best there's so many assumptions there's the lookup tables there's the latitude there's the properties of these materials we're making assumptions for a lot of the materials so from a design perspective it's pretty important to be conservative here so that you don't end up being unable to cool the space and then for part b they want us to consider the question of is this the peak and i guess my answer would be it's hard to say i think it could be the peak but i wouldn't be surprised if it isn't i think it depends largely on when the window load peaks and since the window was kind of one of the confusing areas for this problem that's what makes it hard to say i'm thinking about this term right here this 26 this is a big driver in how much heat transfer happens through the windows and i'm not sure where that's getting looked up so whenever that number is a maximum that's going to cause the heat transfer through the windows to be a maximum and i wonder if that might happen earlier in the day so when does the solar load factor peak if the sun is strongest around noon or one then that part of the equation may peak before 4 p.m but then if you go and look up the cooling load temperature difference values for some time earlier in the day like 12 or 1 they may be lower than they were for 4 p.m so then maybe there's some time in between the two, afternoon but before four, and to really work that out, we would need to take an iterative approach and try different times a day. But I suspect the answer is gonna be sometime between noon and four. And then one more thing to consider is this idea of thermal delay. Because the building materials retain some heat, it keeps the building warm at night, and then that heat is pulled out of the building during the night, and then it's relatively cool and it takes time to absorb heat throughout the day so as a result the inside temperature actually lags what you would expect based on the load driven by delta t or solar and it really depends on the building materials and the situation as to how big of a factor this thermal delay is but just speaking from my own experience managing a commercial office building in new york city operationally we had situations where you would expect to see the peak load at one or two o'clock everyone's coming back for lunch it's a hot summer day the air conditioning is cranking you have the maximum number of people in the building the doors are being opened many many times so there's lots of losses on paper you would expect that to be the hardest part of the day to get through and yet for whatever combination of reasons the peak cooling load when the chillers would have to work the hardest and when we would start to bump into capacity issues potentially when the building's fully occupied was really later in the day between 3 and 4 p.m. And this was a consistent thing. It's not like, you know, one particular day where the sun was behind the cloud at 1 p.m. and it was hotter or the building was being exposed to more sun later in the day. This was a consistent pattern that we observed throughout the hottest days in July. So if I can say one thing about this, whether you're an operator or a designer or, you know, maybe you're not even working in buildings, but the overall takeaway from a problem like this is to be conservative. Understand that your assumptions are only going to be so good and you have to tack on an extra 10 or 20% at the end to make up for the possibility that you might have been short along the way. So that was a long one. If you have any input on some of the questionable parts, especially about the windows, I'd love to hear from you. And I hope you were able to get a lot out of the other parts of this problem that were better defined.